lot of people back from lunch, a lot of people full of lunch. Hopefully you're not all too logy from that. But we're going we're gonna to snap up with some fun stuff here, I think. So yes, I am a physical side penetration tester. I am also really loud, so if you're getting feedback or if I'm screaming at you, just you know, throw something at me because I don't know how to be indoor voicey. You can see me at, uh, at conferences in nice clothes. You can see me in meetings and such where I get all dressed up with a you know, collar or a suit. But the, the consultant side of my job is not the fun side of my Well, I mean, I like it. I like talking to you all. I like being up here. I like, I like solving problems. I like being the problem a lot more, though. So the fun side of my job is breaking in stuff, physical side, physical entry, covert entry. That's what my team and I does. This is us somewhere we completely shouldn't be just you know, blazing in there with cloned badges and popping the alarm system and so on and so forth. My fiance, in an interview she was given, she was like, oh, you know, my man, he's basically professionally dangerous. And my whole team just decided that was, that's a moniker we love. So we just we want to make that our marketing brochure. Because we have a whole ops division and, and PPD and other such. But the covert entry side is what I love to do. And most of the people in this room, more than most of the rooms I show up at, most people here get this. A lot of times you'll see me at, uh, you know, a lot like the Sands Nationals or like a Black Hat event or a very IT focused event. And there, the physical side just kind of doesn't even resonate with a lot of folk in that world. Here, you, you really grasp that technology is a hands-on thing. The network infrastructure is a hands-on thing. I used to be a sysadmin, right? Like, I am a, I've lost all my keyboard food just about nowadays. But if I'm on a physical entry, I can still get to the infrastructure and like throw console cables into stuff. I'm a dummy, but I can do that. And that's gonna get me, there's my rewriting, you know, single user mode firewall rules, woo! Uh, like if, if I can get to your infrastructure, if I can touch it, that's the ball game. So most of you get that, and you fortunately have to kind of kick that argument uphill really hard sometimes. But the idea that you can do everything right when you're standing up your equipment and then undermine it all with like a trip to Home Depot is something I love to share and I love to talk about. Now, because I work with a lot of public firms and utility companies and they really do, you know, they're like, well, forget about like someone getting into the, the, the IT, here it is, it's, here is the infrastructure and you can like, this was a water company. I was like, what, what is these ups and downs? What if I press up a bunch of times? What's this arrow? I'm like, don't do that. I was like, well, I won't, but like, I'm, I didn't just, I just walked in here. Not to mention, you know, depending on your industry, there's just a lot of bad things and like back rooms that people shouldn't be able to just walk out the building with. And again, you'll see later in this presentation where this cart of chlorine gas was being stored. So as you heard in the bio, right, I'm known as a lock picker. If you see me at conferences many times, if you see videos of me online, it's me clicking through images like this, like who has a lock on their door and do you know what's in your locks? And that's fine. Like, I understand that not everyone has taken a lock apart, and you don't really know how the pins work. And may, Has anyone in this room picked a lock? I always, always ask this. So that's a respectable number of hands. Maybe you've learned from some of us at a hacker event. Maybe you've learned from other people at, at different walks of life. But what goes on inside of a lock is not hard to understand. So I've always been up you know, on stage just talking about this and saying, well, you could open a lock with a key, but you can also use picks. But a while back, someone asked me, they're like, man, I wish I was as good a lock picker like you, man. First of all, I'm not a tremendous lock picker. Like, there's better people with picks in the world. But they were like, but man, even if, you know, I wish that was my job, like breaking into stuff with my lock picks. And I was like, you know, as cool as this is, and I can, t I can teach any of you if you want to learn this later. Like, I always have picks on me. I always have locks laying around. But the, the person who asked me that made me really think. I was like, I don't remember the last time I used my lock picks on a job. Covert entry in the real world isn't this. Like, yeah, you could pick a lot of locks and get into places you shouldn't be. And as fun as that is, and as cool and James Bondish as this looks, that's not what we really do on our covert entry exercises. That's not what we do on most client sites. So I said, well, maybe I'll put together a presentation that's way lower, dumber level, but it's the actual stuff that we do all the time. So instead of picking, why not talk about bypassing? So that's the entire focus of this talk. And some of it's gonna be really silly. Like, let's, start, let's get stupid right away, right? Do you know how many hinges I've knocked out on jobs? Like, pop the hinge pins. 
just walk that door away from the frame on that side. They even make a special little like tool for it so you don't have to bang a nail into your thumbs, like this little orange tool. I've used this a lot. If you can see the hinges, chances are that door is accessible to you. Like, this is the inside of a door. It's got all these locks down it. You see all these locks, that's funny. What you don't see are hinges. The hinges are on the outside of this door. Completely valid attack vector. We've used it all the time. Now, I, something I believe in very strongly, I th I'm gonna throw a lot of crazy stuff at you in this talk, but I believe in throwing solutions like as fast as I hit the attacks. Stupid easy solution to this problem. It's called a security hinge. Look at the little peg and the little hole on that left side image. Completely innocuous, it doesn't interfere with how the door works, but if you swing this door shut, that little peg goes in the hole, and from the outside, if I'm out there banging your hinge pins out, the door is still wedged into the door jam. I can't walk it away from the door. What is on the right side, by the way, if you don't want to buy new hinges for everything in your facility, you don't want to like rehang all your doors, those are called jam pins. They're model JP10 or JP12, depending on the thread spacing, uh, that's made by a company called Major Manufacturing. They make a lot of locksmithing supplies. What are jam pins? Well, let's see you have a regular hinge, right? Back these two screws out, replace them with jam pins. Back these two screws out, replace them with nothing. You just made a security hinge without rehanging your door. And it's super fast, it's very cheap, it's super easy, and it completely eliminates for all intents and purposes, that like hinge pin problem right there. You don't have to flip the door around or anything crazy. It's super simple. Want to get even like sillier? Let's, let's talk about another silly thing here. This is a photo from a long time ago when I first met a friend of mine named Keith. Uh, a lot of videos of me online are with this British guy named Keith. He's a good friend of ours. He's been all over the world with us talking about lock picking. But when I first met him, I was in DC, and I was like, I'd emailed him for a while. Oh, Keith, you're going to be in D.C.? You live in D.C.? Yeah, we'd love to have you come to this event. I was excited because I was like, Keith, you are an actual trading locksmith, like in the industry. I've never been a locksmith. I'm certified as a safe technician with the GSA and all this, but I've never been like in the field fixing doors and breaking into stuff professionally before this job. So I said, Keith, I would love to get a look at your like daily carry kit if that you used. He's like, oh, yeah, I still have that pulls out this little zipper pouch and dumps all this stuff out. And I was like, huh, all right, well, that's, that's kind of anticlimactic. I guess you're, you're servicing things in the field. You're not really, like, breaking into stuff. He's like, oh, yeah, this, this is my entry kit. These are my top three entry tools right here. I was like, what? This is back when I was a lock picker. I wasn't a bypasser. I wasn't a covert entry guy. I was a kid. I was like, what? You just, like, you're slipping latches? That really works, like, in TV? He's like, oh, yeah. This thing in the middle is my favorite thing ever. I found it at a yard sale. And what is it? He didn't even know. I eventually figured this out by going through old catalogs. And it's called a traveler hook. It's used in the garment industry, of all things. But it's freaking perfect. So this here we have stuff. a locked door. And we're just going to traveler hook this. Let's see that again. This is, this is a water facility, obviously. Public infrastructure. Completely locked door. Door shut. Yeah. So what is going on there, right? Well, it's just as silly as it sounds, right? We're, we're reaching in, we're reaching into the strike area, grabbing the latch, just hooking and pulling the latch. It's just like if you were to use like a Slim Jim tool. Uh, you can, I mean, Slim Jim, you think of an automotive entry, but you can use chopped down Slim Jims in regular door entry. You're, you're just getting into the strike plate area. You're getting into the latch, hooking and pulling. It's actually a technique that used to be called loiding way back in the day, because when celluloid was a common medium around, you'd it's like credit carding a door. Loiding, latch slipping, these are all latch-based attacks. And you'd think they shouldn't be possible. And even some doors, you know, they put a big old plate so you like, can't get to the latch. Uh, not so quick. Let's see about this with a little bit of piano wire here. Lol, oops. So what's happening here? Why, why, is this, why is this going on? Well, the problem is not the plate or the lack of a plate or I can reach the latch. You shouldn't be able to do this to a latch. A proper modern door should be dead latched. It should be anti-loiting or anti-thrust mechanism. They're all different terms that mean the following. The latch of your door is highlighted in yellow here. That's what actually holds the door shut. Like I can lean on the door and it's not gonna fall open. That's the job of the latch. 
And many people will remember when that's all doors ever had. Sometimes you still see doors like this, like an interior passage door, like a closet door. But as most of us know, like this is what a door latch usually looks like now, some variation of this theme, where you have the main latch and you also have an additional mechanism, an additional little plunger, or sometimes it's a button beneath the main latch. It's an additional mechanism. That is the dead latch engaging mechanism, or the dead latch engagement plunger, sometimes it's called. You might not know this, because when you see this, literally the door's open, so it's all sticking out. When the door is shut, do you know that little plunger is supposed to be held back? That's how this works. If the, the latch sticks out into the strike plate, into the door frame, that little plunger is not supposed to stick out. It's supposed to be pressed in. And when it is, that latch is now dead. You can't slip, hook, grab, shove, Lloyd. The latch is dead. The problem with a lot of the stuff that's in that video and many others that are super hilarious is just door fitment. If you have the wrong strike hardware, if you have the wrong spacing or the door is not hung clean, you're sometimes, I've actually seen people, they'll close a door and they'll say, hey, you didn't close it all the way. And I'm like, look, I'm dumb, but I'm not that dumb. I know how the door works. And they said, no, and they actually go up to it and they go, Kling. see, now it's really closed. Now, I've seen people do this. They're, they're pushing the door so hard that they're actually popping that button out. They are undermining the whole purpose of a dead latch that we've had since the 80s. Here is RFID card enabled door, heavy duty lock. This is a piece of garbage. Like literally, let's watch that again. That's a piece of plastic clamshell packaging that we pulled out of a trash can in the office. I just chopped it with my knife, shoved it in here, and this is the server room. Now look at the strike plate. It's a huge hole in that strike plate, it's massive. Is this a regular off-the-rack metal like strike plate? Speak it up. No, it's not. What kind of strike? I said what kind of card access? It's, it's electronic, right? It's an electronic strike. You've seen these, the solenoid that buzzes or pops when you badge in. There are a lot of different models. And the problem you will get sometimes is that installers and integrators, when they're ordering parts, they'll literally be like, hey, Bobby, remember, we got that job on Main Street. Order the, the 4950s. That's the one with the real big hole. That always works no matter what doors the client has. Like, no, man. You need the right one that fits. Otherwise, you're completely undermining your, your anti-thrust mechanism. Another water facility. So proper you know, sergeant lock, but again. Here we are. It's bad door fitment. Is it double the thing, you think? Yeah, so like, again, $5 hook. And this really nice, I mean, it's a properly, it was a nice lock. I, I could have probably picked that in 20, 30 minutes, like if I just wanted to bang my head into that door. But in 20, 30 seconds, on the long side of like, that's including taking it out of my pants, the hook, to like get it in, boom. Like, and I don't belong in here. You don't want me in here at all. But a $5 hook and no monitoring on that door gets me in here. There's a lot of things you can do. If, there, if I can find any little gap in the doors, I can usually leverage that in interesting ways. Here we have, this is not a, uh, a latch, this is just a crash bar. What happens here though? Literally just reach through the gap and slap the crash bar from the other side. That is a completely feasible attack. They have capacitive uh, sensitive like galvanic response crash bars. They usually have a black pad on them. You just have to use a better you know, conductive medium, so like a heavy copper rod, that'll usually trigger it. But anytime you see, like, here's that weather stripping. A weather stripping is not a security device. And you, know, you can even kind of like stand to the side and look a little bit. You see the light coming through. This door, by the way, that you're seeing right here, which is right out to the street, that is where the chlorine tanks were being stored at this one facility. There's a photo of me later. Like, show, I was like, could I change the levels of chlorine? Could I just wheel this out under the street where my car is? Like, because I bent a piece of metal slapped the crash bar, which is always going to be a uniform height because of code compliance, right? There was just nothing protecting me because that, again, weather stripping is an environmental seal. It didn't have any sort of astragal or plate running down the door. Keep that in mind. It's really not hard. And they, you don't have to just make BS tools. Like, they make really nice tools that are very rugged if you want to do this proper like. Here's Robert popping into a secured meeting room space. And that's just, that's a factory made tool. These are, these are government grade tools that exist just for this purpose. And they're just for you can feel exactly where you want to hit. Exit paddles, same thing. These are all exploitable. And you can even see the gap right there with the light. 
Now you can, I don't know how the lighting is in the projector here, but usually we'll get somebody in a few of those videos, there's something else on the door. You can barely see it. It's further down the door. What else is going on in this door? That some, somebody's usually like, hey, well, wait a minute. You could have blah, blah, blah. Can you see it? Yeah, I'm hearing it. It says deadbolt, deadlock. Yeah, you can just about see there's a little thumb turn down there. Now, this is probably not going to be like a door you could deadbolt during the day because it's an occupied structure. Again, you're dealing with code compliance. But that one video at like 2 in the morning, they're like, oh, come on. You could have, I could have deadbolted that door. That was just laziness. Yeah, they, they, they could have done that. But let's keep in mind, even deadbolts usually are not double-sided with a key. Usually there's a thumb turn. Again, code compliance. Well, this tool exists. You know what this tool is? That's the thumb turn flipper. Stick it through the door. You go, whoop, <laughs> and you, then you just freaking slap the door. Like, this, these tools are out there, man, and they're in all of our kits, and we destroy worlds with these things. And it is not hard to understand. This is you know, just a completely different tack, the idea of exploiting gaps. It's a locked door. It's pretty loud, I'm gonna turn that down. What happened there? That they, stick, they stuck something through the door, something very ephemeral. Let's look from the other side here. This is, yes, I heard somebody, a few people know what's up here. So in the hat, we have Bobak. He's our electronics expert. He just showed our buddy Ross this, this attack. We're in a development lab space that we use to build out some of our chips and gear. And Ross is like, oh, come here. I just learned this, guys. Check it out. So it's a locked door, card reader door. And he's sticking something in a little bit of a gap. And you can even see through the glass what happens. Oh, door suddenly opened. He's using a very sophisticated, it's a very restricted government tool. Uh, if you have clearance, like talk to your people. If you're, I think if you're TS or SCI, you can order this tool through a special catalog. It comes with the instruction manual that is, uh, is like eyes only, and it's a one-page manual. It says, hold it like this. And all you do is you're just gassing off that butane, that which boils off in the atmosphere. You're creating a cloud of super cold air and we're tricking out what are called REX sensors, or request to exit sensors. This is a locked door, mag lock, electronic lock system, and you can, you can see the sensor right there gets triggered. What are we triggering it with temperature? Well, these sensors are designed to tell if a human being is exiting a facility. Many of you have these. If you badge in but don't have to badge out, many facilities, unless you have a push to exit button, you just kind of walk towards the door, and the door is unlocked, and you can egress. These sensors are designed usually just to detect therm thermal differential. In fact, the cheapest one, the one at the bottom in the middle right there, that Honeywell, man, that is far and away 80% of what we see in the field, that exact sensor or a rebrand of that sensor. All they're looking to do is, is something temperature different here? Because you don't want false negatives. You don't want someone with a bunch of boxes to like bang into the door and fall over because that's going to be a bad user experience, and that vendor is going to get calls, and they're going to have to keep coming out and servicing it. They want to order the part that always picks up motion. It always is going to open the door. There are better types of REX sensors. There are microwave-based radar, RCR, range-controlled radar. They are much more uh, difficult to fake out. But again, cost, reliability, usability. PIR, passive infrared, is what we see everywhere. And you can trick them out with a bunch of silly stuff. If you ever attend a wonderful There's conference one called DerbyCon, the this is Dave Kennedy, the former Marine, runs DerbyCon, he runs TrustedSec. Uh, he is a big eSig guy. He like sub-ohms his coils and does really big vape clouds. So he learned this trick. He's like, Nickerson, our buddy Chris Nickerson taught him this. He's like, hey, try, try blowing some of your big smoke through that door. Sure enough, took him a couple get big lungfuls here, but you can hear, he's listening for the solenoid. Click. That's wonderful to me. I think that's, I mean, I've done stuff like this, not with, I don't smoke, uh, I drink too much. This was in Montana, really late at night. I was walking home uh, with my fiance. This is a bank. So relaxed. I was just walked out of a bar with like my whiskey. There was a rec sensor up there. But uh, there was a rec sensor. <laughs> Oops, you know. It's funny, too, because I, was, I didn't even know she filmed that, because uh, it's only funny because I'm all dressed up. Like, that's the only thing that makes that video cool. But I was like, hey, honey, check this out. And she, she's like, oh, I know what that means. Get my phone out. She, something's going to happen. So absolutely, anything that I can get to that gap or the, the bottom gap. Let's talk about the bottom of a door. Most doors have a gap on the bottom or the top, right? 
How do you exploit this? You exploit this with the lever-style door handle that almost every door in a major commercial facility has. When's the last time you've seen a door knob on anything? Like, a long time. You don't usually see that. Again, why? Code compliance. People with limited grip, limited tactile ability need to be able to operate doors. The lever-style handle set is what we see in all commercial and industrial spaces. What can you do with this? There was a little bit of footage that was being filmed for a special where I demonstrate what you can do with this. Here is what's called an underdoor attack. Well, I'm nowhere near the lock. I just kind of reach down, I grab something, I lean into it, and the door flies open. What did I do there? Let's just, this is on an actual job, doing it again. This is not like they saw the camera in that footage. This is not Hollywood hocus pocus. This is Robert on a you know, two in the morning getting into some IDF closet. And again, he's nowhere near the lock, but he's going to be able to unlock this door and pop it open. Here we go. He thinks he's on it. He's a little more meticulous than I am. I'm kind of the bull in the china shop of the team. He leans on it. He's got a little bit of pressure with his head. That's using your head, Robert. And sure enough, that door just click right open. What we're doing could not be simpler. We are sending a rod under the door with a string on it. You feel where you are, you feel where the handle is, and you yank. You're just pulling the inside handle. This tool exists for no other purpose than to reach under the door and hit, because if you imagine you're inside of a door, you're inside of like a secure room, usually if you just hit the handle and leave, that unlocks the door. You're not fumbling with like keys and like, I'm gonna flip the, the thumb turn on this lock. Almost always, again, for code compliance, if it's not a low occupancy structure, hitting that door handle is going to egress, or in your case, ingress. How do you prevent this? There are products because you know the, the, the vertical gap, you're just you're putting a big plate. The bottom, you can't like have the door dragging on the ground. There are products called dynamic door bottoms, though. This is a little plunger, and you can see when the plunger hits the side of the wall, it will drop this bottom down. Now, this little animation is not really showing you a security product. This is a, just an environmental seal for heating and cooling. But that principle of the door closes, the bottom drops, that exists in other high-end products. So a company called Pemco, P-E-M-K-O, I believe. Pemco, which is a division of Asa Abloy, who, who owns like everybody now. Uh, the Pemco, I think this, I have a model number for you. The Pemco 530 is a semi-mortise or external fit door bottom that is, it's not just a little rubber seal. I mean, this is a heavy metal plate that interacts with a contoured floor plate. When you close this door, that plate drops and locks, and there is no way to get under this door. Now, is that something you want to put on every single door in your facility? No, that's overkill. It's like a $100 item. Pick your four or five most sensitive doors and completely annihilate my ability to swing an under door tool under there. I would not say that's a bad allocation of funds. Here we have a commercial door with this an ADA handle. This is harder to prevent. Uh, it's locked. This is great. It's a room that we uh, want to get into. So instead of lock picking, this is an over door or attack. Method, we're going to use 35 millimeter film. Cheaper tool. Uh, with our loop that we've already previously made. If you can find film, does, does film exist anymore nowadays? I don't know. Lock. So you go on eBay, you film, find yourself some 35 millimeter film, and you shove it into the crack. If there's I'm going to turn the volume down and just in, talk through the rest of this um, video here. Weather stripping, you can try to. So if you can imagine what's going to happen, this is not a pull down attack. This is a, a yank it up attack. This person, this is someone named Infosec Pope. Uh, he, he's out in Utah. Good guy. Works at the 801 space. And he shows this to people all the time. Because remember, if you're looking at a door and you've got a handle on your side, you know where the handle is on the other side. You can just kind of measure with your arm, like, oh, this is how much room I've got. He makes a little tick mark in the film, feeds it over the door, sticks a little bit extra so it bows out as a loop, and just yanks on it. He just walks it over and yanks on it, and you're pulling the handle up. Many people might not even realize it's possible to pull a, you know, an internal handle up. It'll operate the door 90 times out of 10. So this is obviously on this side of the door, it's a little not clear, but here's on the inside. You can see, we'll race it along. It's, it's, it's almost comical, right? Like you're just watching this loop. Imagine if you were working in the server room, you're just watching this kind of, what's happening on that door? But he's great, I mean, he can do it perfectly. He's done it so many times, he knows exactly how to flip and pull and then yank, and there you go. Really hard to prevent these kind of attacks if you're complying with code for a low occupancy, for a regular occupancy structure. If you're low occupancy, have legal, see if you can get a variance. A lot of times you can throw out a lot of these problems. If you can't, want some more really awesome cheap solutions? Get one of these. 
This is a blocking shroud. I saw this on a door once only after we couldn't get under it. We're like get, trying to run under it, run it. I'm like, I know I'm on it. What the, Robert, try this thing. And Robert's down there cursing. Eventually, I went out to the truck, came back with our bore scope, which I use for safe cracking. And I looked under the, I was like, oh, son of a bitch. What the hell is that? You know, and then we talked through it for like half an hour and got the damn thing open. I was like demanding the client. I was like, where did you get this thing? This made us kick our heads in for half an hour at the server room. He's like, oh, I found it in like a Granger catalog or something. It's not a security product. It's like so in service areas, you don't bash into door handles. It's just for that. It's for carts going by doors. And I think that's why they had it in the server room, because they had equipment carts. But it completely ruined my day. Have you seen, maybe you've stayed in hotels where the door handles are mounted down? Who's seen this? It, it happens a lot. And I've asked hoteliers, I'm like, hey, I just, I gotta know, the door handle, is that, is that like the underdoor attack? I'm like, oh, you've heard about that. Big problem in hotels, underdoor attacks as like room theft problems. I've seen hotels do this. This was really cool because not, not that it's so, it's a very effective solution. I could not I imagine trying to negotiate film over the top or an underdoor tool. But again, like I was staying at a hotel for a week, made friends with the staff, and I was like, hey, you got to tell me. Obviously, you're, you're preventing like illegal entries. Where did you get this product? He's like, oh, yeah, that. So you know if you have like closet doors and carpet in your bedroom, it's those little clips that you put on the floor? Four dollars at Home Depot screwed into every one of their hotel room doors, completely stops anybody from feasibly executing this attack in a reasonable manner. I love that. I think that is the, I love that more than the freaking Pemco 530 bottom. This is awesome, and it's cheap, and it's effective. So there's a lot of different ways that we can get in. There's a lot of different odd things that we do as covert entry teams. Not all of them are this dumb. There's some high-end stuff and high-speed things that, if you, you know, hang out in our classes, man, like we'll do clamshell key copying with clay molds and, you know, you're pouring liquid in. I teach safe cracking. I've taught it at SANS before. I teach it elsewhere. I'm a GSA certified safe tech. I can teach anyone in this room to manipulate probably a group two safe dial in about a day. You would, it is not as hard as you think. So we love approaching the whole picture. We love the audiences that will listen to like the crazy stuff like this. I got a couple more gems for you that were, I know we still got some time here. My favorite thing to like laugh about these days, and it applies a lot to this room, is key to like systems. Manufacturers that ship everything key to like, and a lot of customers don't know. I'm standing next to, well, both Dennis and I are both standing next to little like, they're called telephony access control boxes. You see them on the front of a lot of buildings and apartments and such. Dennis is standing next to a Lanier cabinet. I'm standing next to a Door King system. Both of those, the manufacturers have one key. There's Lanier. A126 key for all linear commercial grade cabinets. Every single linear of like the higher, higher end, the A100, A1200, you just you know, open the cabinet and then all the door relays, they have little momentary switches right there. Just press all of them until the door opens. Like there it is, you can just buy it. You can buy this right now online. This is not a restricted key. Door King systems. The Door King, what is it, the, the 1216 key? Completely, every Door King install since 1992 has used this key. And it's everywhere. Everywhere, if I show you like how to identify door king boxes, they have these three big silver buttons, the A, the Z, and the Enter. Like you'll start seeing them on every building. It's like, I got these keys on me right now. I am literally, I'm pretty sure I'm carrying them, yeah. And there's the door king key right there. There's the linear key right there. What, there I got another key right here. This is, this is a really fun one. This is the 1284X key. Google 1284X, and you start seeing a lot of a certain kind of vehicle. Ford. Ford's fleet key is the 1284X. It shows up in, you know, big vehicles. It shows up in their uh, expeditions and excursions. It shows up a lot in Crown Vicks, baby. <laughs> if a city gets a whole bunch of Ford vehicles and they want them all keyed alike, that happens a lot. It's probably the 1284X. This is a Home Depot copy that you can see. There's no chip in this key. It's not a modern key. This will open and start and open the trunk and the glove box of probably about 40% of the black and white rollers in this country. It's like just, they're all the same. There are cities right now, big huge cities, where most of the taxis in the city have the same key as the police cruisers in that city. Key to like systems are hilariously crazy exploitable. 
How does this relate to facilities? Besides the, like, the, the front door, you know, telephony thing? Many electromechanical key switches are all stock and keyed alike. If you've ever seen my buddy Howard and I talk about elevator systems, exploiting elevators, you can turn on and off a lot of security features in elevators. The key switches are manufacturer specific. Here you can actually see, this is an interesting install here. Like, this is a mixed batch of keys. You can see the little graffiti inside the, uh, the, the, the cabinet, right? So it says fire service phase one and two is EX515. That's innovation fixtures. But clearly this is a Montgomery Kone elevator because it's Kone 4 and Kone 1 and Kone. I have all these keys. I have them in this bag right here. We just have all the default keys for basically every elevator and mechanical key switch. Interestingly enough, Montgomery Kone elevators here in this building, but they use innovation fixtures. Don't ask me how I know that. And what's an example of this sort of thing, right? Like, you've been in buildings. I'm not saying this is, this is not footage from this hotel. I'm not shitting where I eat. But like buildings where you need a key card access to drive an elevator to a different floor. Here is a building like that. Here is a building where you can maybe place some low-level calls, but if you want to go to like the top nice floors, you can't get up to the executive levels and so forth, okay? So I can't get up to 33, 32. Why? Well, there's a card reader there. But this is an Otis Series 7 elevator, so that's the BGM 30 key. And I go, card reader, off. <laughs> Yay. And now that floor has latched its call, so I can turn the card reader back on and re-secure the panel and just go up to the executive level and bang around. Like, literally, that's what it's, it's card reader on off. This is, perhaps, if any of you take this away, man, for key to, like, big building risks, this is the story of the FEO K1. Ask me later, I won't get into the whole background of what happened to create this standard. It is a super standard fire key that many buildings will use for fire access. So, so if they have all different keys in all different areas, but the FEO K1, well, they can just put a little red box on the wall. And then all the fire keys, all the important keys in the building are inside this one box. This is walking around a building that happened to use the FEO K1 standard. Call the elevator, pretend you're getting on the elevator when in fact you reach up really quickly with your FEO K1, swing open that firebox and take some stuff out of it. What does this then allow you to do as we walk around, somebody walks around this building. We were totally okay there. But. So we get into this machine room, which it's a small building, small office, so they were also using it, you could barely see, as their security office. And then it's all their industrial controls for the elevator right there including this is actually the uh, drop key storage inside the machine room. But again, there's like a whole elevator hacking talk I've given, talking about what you can do if you're in the machine room or the motor room, what you can do at the elevator controller. And the fact that we were able to get around this building. Now this was the fire service key for that building, like if we wanted to throw the elevators onto fire service. It was the alarm panel key to get into the alarm enunciators and, and turn on and off the alerts. The sprinkler valve lockouts, we could have unlocked and changed the sprinkler valve flows and you know, turn them, lock them on or off. All of this, including the elevator controls themselves and the controller panel, for a key that sells on eBay right now for about eight bucks. Key to like systems are crazy, man. Mechani electromechanical key switches are not as secure as you might think. And to wrap that to a, an even sillier electromechanical story, storefront, Building late at night, friends of ours, they said, oh man, you should see what we, we, we had happen the other night. We, we had an alert, and we came in the next morning, and everything looked fine. It looked like no one was there, nothing got touched, but we, we asked the neighbors across the street for some uh, footage. This is what we saw. We saw a guy come up late at night. He's standing near this big roll-up door. He does something, and the freaking garage door comes up. And the guy, they said he looked around a little bit, kind of didn't want to, I don't know if he got spooked or something. He was very polite. He rolled the door back down and walked away. So they immediately, once they saw this, they ran around to the alley and they said, what the hell do they? They looked at their thing. I don't know if you can see what happened here. That is a Medeco lock, which is a nice lock. Medeco makes a lot of key switches and a, you know, a lot of interesting industry gear. It wasn't installed correctly. The whole cylinder didn't have its mortise set screws in the side. They just had the rear bolt. Someone just took vice grips and turned the whole cylinder to like open and like drove the door. And then they were really nice, man. It was San Francisco. They're so polite, the criminals, I guess, because he turned the door all the way over the clothes and drove the door shut again and then walked away. So that is unreal, the, the confluence of both the mechanical and the electronic world. We talk about the electronic side. This is not an electronic talk. 
Uh, if you want to learn more about that, I am happy to have the fellow you saw in the hat, Bobak, our director of research. He is our, he's the guy who weaponizes like long range readers. We'll take RFID credential readers that are, you see these in like parking garages. They're long range, you know, a couple feet. But he'll gut them, he'll weaponize them, put a power supply in there, put an ESP key in there, a Bluetooth module. And then that's, you know, we just call it the hunt pad. We'll just walk around client sites with that in our backpack. And here's Dennis, he's gonna do a card grab on this guy on the bench. Dennis looks like he's on his phone. He's really just grabbing credentials. Realize, oh, I got a good badge read. He's gonna get up and leave. So this is not Hollywood hocus pocus. If you have questions about that sort of thing, cloning of credentials, replaying attacks, yes, Prox can be killed. Yes, I-Class can be killed. Yes, I-Class SE is vulnerable. Even if you're using really high-end, like super, your integrator sold you like I-Class CEOs, or MyFair does fire NX, like new, the, the latest stuff from NXP. We can put sniffers on the back side of the reader. That's our new thing we like to do a lot now. You install a little Wigan sniffer on the protocol side, put the reader back on the wall, and then we can just sniff credentials as they're being sent down the wire in the clear and like replay those from our phones. Completely valid like line of attack, man. And it's easy to do. We do this in class. You, we'll let you take readers off the wall and click them in, get the sniffers, we'll tr show you how to decode the credentials. It is really fun to be that person at your facility who can do this and show people Oh yeah, you know, I really understand that we paid all this money for the system, but because we didn't put a tamper resistant screw on the bottom of this reader, I was able to click in a little, you know, sniffer tool, and now I got everyone's badge, and I just clone myself to be any badge I want. If you like this kind of stuff, we are happy to talk to you about it more a different day. You can, hell, you're all SANS students, you're all here. Like, we are an odd duck at, we don't show up at a lot of the SANS events. This is not a uh, logistic that SANS is used to running, but we do run these occasional physical penetration courses. And we're a small niche, but if, if this interests you, you can always ask us about that another time. Mostly though, I, I'm not here to sell you on anything. I'm not here to, I don't work for any of the names that I mentioned, like major manufacturing. And I just like those solutions. I like those jam pins. I, I like simple fixes. And when you keep the physical side in mind, and you understand that if someone physically can get to the infrastructure, that's the ball game. Physical attack is a data attack. They're, they are not two separate worlds. If you get that, you can protect it pretty easily. I love what I do because when I show people these really scary things, I'm not like, all right, well, I hope you budgeted $50,000 to fix this. Like, this is me being like, yeah, well, see, this is striking here, and you could probably reset this door by a quarter inch. This was an article in the Locksmith Ledger years ago. You can see it was literally a strike plate that was misaligned, and the locksmith didn't even order a new one. Uh, he or she just unscrewed it, pop riveted a piece of scrap metal, and made it just a little bit narrower, and then the door worked fine. They make products called like an adjust a strike, where you can just really jank, just kind of kludgy fix, man. But these are the solutions. This is what correcting a problem in my world is like. It's not, oh my God, how are we gonna provision budget to like completely re-engineer everything we did wrong? Your, your solution is usually a hardware store solution. It's not deploying a whole new security center and spending all this money. Your solution is send somebody to the store and fix this for eight bucks, and then guys like me can't get back in.